Hi guys, so today we're going to be talking about centripetal acceleration, starting off with some theory and then again moving on to some problem solving from the Nelson textbook. So the only definition in this section is uniform circular motion. This is the motion of an object with constant speed but changing direction. It travels along a circular path of constant radius. Note that although the speed is constant, the direction is changing, which means there must be a change in velocity. Recall that acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. Since there's a change in velocity, there must be acceleration. The specific acceleration that the object experiences is centripetal acceleration. Centripetal is synonymous with center-seeking. Centripetal acceleration is represented by A subscript C, and the direction of this is always toward the center of the circle. There are three different formula variations of centripetal acceleration. The Nelson textbook goes through the derivations, however, this is not needed on tests usually. So these are the three formulas that you'll be using. The more you use them, the more they'll get engraved in your brain. And of course, if you have these in your brain already, instead of searching through the formula sheet, it can make problem solving much faster. The first one is AC is equal to V squared over R. Second one being AC is equal to 4 pi squared R over T squared, which is the period. And then the third equation, AC is equal to 4 pi squared R F squared. V represents velocity, R represents a constant radius, capital T represents period. So period is the amount of time required for a full revolution to occur, and this has the unit seconds, whereas frequency is the amount of revolutions completed within a certain time. So in SI units, it's represented by hertz, which is 1 over second, because the revolution part is unitless. That's all for the theory for this section. Now we'll go through the Nelson textbook problems. I picked out a few good questions from page 119. Most of the problems in this section are just rearranging formulas and plugging in numbers, so it's pretty straightforward. Starting off with number one, you have a puck on a string and you twirl the puck with a uniform circular motion in a horizontal circle along virtually frictionless ice. Part A asks, what causes the centripetal acceleration of the puck? So the centripetal acceleration is caused by the tension of the string. This tension is what keeps the puck in its circular path at a constant speed. Note that there's no new force that causes this centripetal acceleration. Rather, the force that provides centripetal acceleration must be one of the forces previously introduced. Part B asks, how does doubling the radius of the circle and leaving the speed unchanged affect the centripetal acceleration? So to figure this out, you just use the equation AC is equal to V squared over R. However, instead of using R, you plug in 2R. Factoring V squared over R, which is the formula that we know is equal to centripetal acceleration, you can determine that your factor is 1 half. Therefore, doubling your radius would mean that the centripetal acceleration would be halved. Part C asks, how does doubling the speed and leaving the radius unchanged affect the centripetal acceleration? So this time we're using the same equation, which is AC is equal to V squared over R, except this time plugging in 2V. Since that V term is squared, the whole term is squared, so 2V squared is equal to 4V squared over R, obviously. Therefore, doubling the speed and leaving the radius unchanged means that the centripetal acceleration would be quadrupled. Moving on to question number 6. An amusement park ride consists of a rotating cylinder with a coarse fabric on the walls for friction. Participants on this ride stand against the wall as the cylinder rotates. After the cylinder reaches a constant speed, the floor of the ride drops away beneath the occupants. They remain against the wall because of the centripetal acceleration, which must be greater than 25 meter per second squared. This ride has a radius of 2 meters. Determine the minimum frequency of rotation of the cylinder. So we know the radius is 2 meters, and we know that the acceleration must be greater than 25 meter per second squared, and we're solving for frequency. Using one of the formula variations, and then I think for frequency, you get that it's equal to the centripetal acceleration over 4 pi squared r, all square rooted. Rounding to 2 sig figs, the frequency is equal to 0 0.56 hertz. Now for question number 8, a jogger is running around a circular track that has a circumference of 478 meters. The magnitude of the centripetal acceleration of the jogger is 0 0.146 meter per second squared. Calculate the jogger's speed in kilometers per hour. So we know the circumference is 478 meters, which is also equal to 2 pi r for a circle. 
Isolating for radius in that circumference equation, we solve that the radius of the circle is 76.08 meters. The centripetal acceleration of the jogger was given 0.146 meter per second squared, and here we're solving for speed. Using the equation AC is equal to V squared over R, isolating for speed, V is equal to the magnitude of centripetal acceleration times radius, all square rooted, using factor label method to convert the speed from meter per second to kilometers per hour. The final speed of the jogger is 12 kilometers per hour. For question number 9, a bicycle wheel with a radius of 0.3 meters is spinning clockwise at a rate of 60 revolutions per minute. Part A asks us to calculate the period of the wheel's motion. So we know radius is equal to 0.3 meters. The rate is 60 revolutions per minute. Since revolutions is unitless as mentioned, you can convert this into hertz to find frequency just by using factor label method. You get that the frequency is 1 hertz. In order to solve for period, we're actually going to use two of the formula variations for centripetal acceleration. First, AC is equal to 4 pi squared r f squared. Since we know the frequency, we can plug all the numbers in that we know to solve for the magnitude of centripetal acceleration. Then using that magnitude, we're plugging it that in to another equation, which is AC is equal to 4 pi squared r over t squared. Isolating for period and then solving, you get that the period is equal to 1 second. Part B asks us to calculate the centripetal acceleration of a point on the edge of the wheel if at that instant it moves westward. Looking at a compass, we know that westward is on the left. If you look at my yellow and purple arrow here, the purple arrow is the centripetal acceleration, and it's always towards the center of the circle. You know that the wheel is spinning clockwise, hence why I drew the blue arrow in the clockwise direction. You note that the yellow arrow is actually the centripetal acceleration at the point they're asking for. And you'll note that this is in the upwards direction, which is north. So since the point on the edge moves westward and clockwise, and also since we know that the centripetal acceleration is always towards the center of the circle, then the centripetal acceleration at that point must be north. The velocity at any point is perpendicular to the centripetal acceleration. So you note that the yellow and purple arrow make it 90 degrees. Since AC is equal to V squared over R and radius is a scalar quantity, you know that the velocity is what determines the direction of a centripetal acceleration at any specific point. Therefore, the centripetal acceleration of that point is 11.8 meter per second squared north. Lastly, for question number 11, the record distance for the hammer throw is about 87 meters. To achieve this distance, an athlete must produce a centripetal acceleration of nearly 711 meter per second squared. Part A says, given a radius of 1.21 meters, calculate the speed of the ball when it's released. So we know centripetal acceleration and radius, and we're just plugging that into AC is equal to V squared over R. Isolating for V, you get that the speed required is 29.3 meter per second. Part B says, the athlete lets go of the ball when it's 2 meters above the ground, moving at an angle 42 degrees above the horizontal. Determine the range and ignore any air friction. So we know the initial velocity since we know that the speed of the ball when it was released is 29.33 meter per second, and we know that theta is 42 degrees above the horizontal. We know displacement in the y component is 2 meters down since the ball was released 2 meters above the ground. And here we're solving for range, which is synonymous with displacement in the x component. So we know the two perpendicular components are related through time since they share the same time of flight. We don't have enough information to solve for the x component right away, so we'll be first working in the y component. Initial velocity in the y component is related through sine, since that's the opposite side, giving us 19.63 meter per second. Displacement in the y is negative 2.0 meters, since I let upwards and forwards be positive. Acceleration in the y is equal to gravity, which is negative 9.8 meter per second squared, again because gravity is in the downwards direction. Solving for time using one of the big five equations, you just bring all the terms onto one side and you'll see that you have an equation in quadratic form. So using the quadratic formula, you just plug in to solve for time. You get two times, one of which is a negative number, so we know that's inadmissible. And the reason for this is because time is a scalar quantity, so it cannot be negative. The time that we solve for is 4.101 seconds. Now applying this to the x component, we know initial velocity in the x component is related through cos since that's the adjacent side. This gives us 21.796 meter per second. 
We know that the displacement in the x is equal to range, which is equal to velocity in the x component times time. Note that initial velocity in the x component is equal to the overall velocity in the x component since there's no acceleration in the x component. So the range is equal to 89 meters when plugging those numbers in. That wraps it up for this video. Stay tuned for next time to learn about centripetal force.